Okay, we're getting into the last part of the Instructor Physics course, and it's about angular momentum. So what the heck is angular momentum? I'm going to show you. Okay, let's start with a simple example. Suppose I have two balls out in the middle of deep space so that there's nothing else around. And these two balls are connected by a spring, and the spring has no mass, uh, just to make it easier. So this is a great situation to start with, because I can completely model this situation. I can calculate the forces on each ball, and I can use that to update the momentum. So here's how I would do that. I would, uh, and, and these, um, is, it does a weird oscillation because of the way the spring is made. But, uh, so I have the force on each ball is based on the position of that spring. And from that force, I can define momentum. And the change in momentum is related to the force on that ball. And then I can do it for the other ball too. They have the same but opposite forces on it. After I find the change in momentum, I can use that to update the position and just repeat the whole thing back and forth forever. And that's the idea of a numerical calculation. So there's nothing super fancy about this. It's just two balls oscillating back and forth, and, and that's fine. Now, I could also give them some initial momentum. Okay, so we're at that part where we need to start talking about angular momentum. But what the heck is angular momentum anyway? Okay, so we want to look at this last idea of angular momentum. But what the heck is angular momentum anyway? Let me show you with a simple example, starting with a simple example. Suppose I have two objects in space. These are two masses, they have different masses, and they're connected by a massless spring. The nice thing about this situation is that if I know the mass, and I know the value of the spring constant, I can actually calculate the spring force on each mass and model the motion. So here's, if I, I let them uh, pull apart and oscillate back and forth, I can build this model very easily. Since I know the force, I can define momentum as mass times velocity, and then I can say, once I calculate that force, I can use that force to update the momentum in a short time interval, use the momentum to update the position, and just re keep repeating that over and over. And that's what this is. This is a Python program uh, of two masses oscillating with a spring connected by them. And everything's happy. I'm happy. I don't know about you, but I'm happy. But what if I then take the same situation and give them some uh, trend, some initial momentum not per, not in the direction of the, of the spring? And we get this uh, orbital motion, but again, it's the same physics. It's the exact same thing. I can calculate the force. I can update the momentum. I can update the position. Now, you're going to notice here that this motion looks a little complicated, the, the rotation rate and stuff like that. But that's what we want to be able to do. We want to describe this with a new quantity called angular momentum. So let's first look at linear momentum. Is linear momentum conserved? So if I plot the just the x component of the momentum uh, as a function of time for the two masses, uh, and I use blue and red, and I'm not sure why, You've heard about it before, but now we need to find out what the heck is this idea of angular momentum. Suppose I start with an example. Suppose we have two masses out in deep space where so there's no gravitational forces on them, there's no air resistance. All there is are two masses and a spring connecting them. And, the, and they have different masses just to make it fun. And this is a really nice situation because if I know the value of that spring constant, and the positions of the two balls, I can calculate the spring force. If I know that spring force, I can then model this motion just using normal momentum. So this is what that would look like. So the momentum is defined as mass times velocity, and I can calculate the force on each object. And from that, I can use a small time interval and update the momentum at the end of the time interval. I can then use that momentum to update the position and then repeat the thing over and over and over again. And that's exactly what we have here. This is an animation that from an actual numerical calculation in Python, uh, and it's not anything magic. If I can do it in one dimension, 
I can do it in two dimensions. So this is the exact same program, just with the different initial conditions. So now I give the, the two balls uh, momentum in the y direction, if you would call a y in the vertical direction. And you'll see that they rotate around. So in before looking at angular momentum, let's look at linear momentum. So if momentum is mass times velocity, and I plot the x component of momentum for the two objects, I can't plot the total momentum because that's the vector. So I'm just plotting the x momentum. So here you see the blue and the red curves are the x momentums of the two objects. And as one goes up, the other one goes down. If you add them together, you get the black line, which you can't even see. It's on zero. So this has a total momentum of zero for the two objects combined, and that momentum is constant throughout time. So this is what we call conservation momentum. Momentum is conserved for the two ball system. And this is in the x direction. You could do it again in the y and in the z direction too, but you can only plot one of them. What about energy? If I define the kinetic energy of the each ball as one half mv squared, the scalar value, and the spring potential energy as one half ks squared, where s is the amount of stretch of the spring, then I can plot here the kinetic energy of one ball, the kinetic energy of the other ball, and the spring potential energy. And if you add all three of those together and plot it over time, you get that black line that's up near 0.18, and that's the total energy. So in this case, the total energy is constant, and energy is also conserved. So momentum is conserved, and energy is conserved. What about another quantity that's conserved that doesn't change with time? What if I plot the angular velocity of those rotating balls as a function of time? The, this would be the, the angular position, the change in angular position divided by the change in time uh, relative to each other. And as they move further and further apart, this is actually a negative value. It starts off because of the way it's rotating. But as they get further and further apart, the angular velocity decreases. So the angular velocity is not conserved in this case. So we can't say uh, angular velocity is conserved. The same is true for linear velocity. Linear velocity was not conserved, but momentum was. I should have had that graph. So here we have a new quantity that we're going to define, angular momentum. So angular momentum uses the value, the, the symbol L, capital L we use for angular momentum. And it's defined as the, uh, you need to pick a point about which you calculate the angular momentum, and it's R cross P. So that cross is the vector cross product. Uh, and it's, I have it right there for you, but I don't really want to get into it too much. Um, so if I have this point, this white point right here, and my, my mass, the red mass right there has a momentum vector P, the vector from the point to the mass is vector R. I take R cross P and I get the angular momentum vector. Uh, it's uh, not like the dot product because that gives you a scalar value. Uh, so here's an animation to show you the cross product. Here I have two vectors A cross B and then the cyan uh, arrow shows the direction of the resultant and it is always perpendicular to both A and B. And the magnitude of A cross B depends on the magnitude of A, the magnitude of B, and the angle between them. So this is what we call the angular momentum, and it depends on R and P. So I can pick some location and calculate R cross P for both of the masses in this situation. And I can use the center mass in this case. Uh, and I'll plot R cross P for the two of them. And you'll see the blue and the red curve are the individual angular momentums, and they're not constant. But the total angular momentum are uh, L1 plus L2. And again, this is in the z direction because you can't plot a vector. I'm plotting the z component of the angular momentum. The green line shows the total angular momentum in the z direction, and that is constant. So angular momentum is something that is conserved. And that's really the best definition of it. If we do this, it's conserved. And just like momentum and just like energy. And it turns out that conserved quantities are very useful. Well, that's fine and everything. Those are two point masses. But what if I have an extended mass, a rigid object? 
Here is a super great animation. This was made by, I believe it was made by Bruce Sherwood, the author of the Matter and Interactions textbook. And what he did was made a whole bunch of masses connected by springs. So the cyan dots are masses and they're connected by these yellow springs. And so it's a rod. In this case, he hit the rod on the left and two things happened. The red dot there is the center of mass. The center of mass moves and the rod rotates. So you could use angular momentum to describe this problem, but it doesn't. It just uses forces. So a rigid object is just like a point mass object. It's ex There's a whole bunch of them. So in a sense, angular momentum, we don't always need angular momentum because you could always just break an object into its individual points. Of course, if you have some a pencil or something like that, you're going to deal with Avogadro's number of particles and they're all connected together and it's too complicated. Okay, But just like with the two masses connected by a spring, I could use just the momentum principle and forces. I don't need to use angular momentum. Technically the same is true for a rigid object. And that's not even an actual rigid object. It does bend. But the point is that angular momentum is a shortcut that allows us to deal with more complicated objects like rigid objects and deal with their rotation instead of dealing with individual points. So how do we deal with a rigid object? Well, there's two things that we need. The first is a new definition for the angular momentum. It's going to be equal to, for a rigid object, it's going to be this quantity i called the moment of inertia times omega, the angular velocity of that object. Now, you have to define the moment of inertia with respect to some axis. And you take all of the pieces of that object and you add up the mass of that piece times its distance from the axis squared. And of course, if it's a continuous object, you can actually turn this into an integral and you can get uh, equations for different objects for their moment of inertia. Um, but look at that equation for the angular momentum, I omega it looks a lot like p equals mv. So instead of v, I have omega, the angular velocity. Instead of p, momentum, I have angular momentum. And so i, I like to think of it as angular mass. It, it's a measure of how the mass is distributed about an about a, a axis of rotation. And it tells you how the rotational motion of that object changes. Okay, momentum is conserved when there are no external forces. If I had an extra force on one of those original masses and I plotted the total momentum, it would not be constant. So that is an important thing to remember. Angular momentum is conserved when there is no external torque. And I didn't really show that, but we're going to show that later. What happens if you have a torque on a system? The angular momentum is not constant. The value of the angular momentum depends on where you calculate it from. So if I pick the center mass for the two uh, spring connected masses, I'd get a particular angular momentum. If I pick another location, I'd get a different angular momentum. And that's fine. In both cases, the angular momentum wouldn't change. So it would still be conserved. It would just have different values. And finally, the moment of inertia is not a scalar. That is a lie. Okay, but if you have an object rotating about a fixed axis, then we can treat the moment of inertia as a scalar value. In fact, it's way more complicated than that. The rotation of rigid objects is super difficult. Okay, and it deals with things that are really difficult to, uh, to model. So in this course, probably I'm going to be using the fixed axis model for rotational motion so that it can't so that the angular velocity and the angular momentum will always be in the same direction but that's not always true okay so that was a brief introduction to angular momentum we will do some other physics problems later